on Prime Crime. I went downstairs and his face was covered in blood. Do you know what they were hitting him with? A gun. The desperate search for a husband and father. I think you know exactly really who did, did this, and I think you're scared. And the investigation that leads to an unthinkable conclusion. Chris Durant calls dispatch, and that turns out to be a, an important uh, moment right there. Hey there, everybody. I'm Jesse Weber, and welcome to Prime Crime. This is where we do a deeper dive into the most high-profile and memorable true crime cases. What starts out as a terrifying home invasion turns into something else entirely. Taz County 911, what's your emergency? I have a home invasion. My niece is tied up. She's tied up. She is tied up and dead. It's February 20th, 2015 in Titus County, Texas. Ginger Kesterson is on the phone with police, explaining that someone broke into the home of her niece. I am untying her. I can't get the door. What is the victim's name? Uh, Samantha Wolford. According to Wolford, she managed to break free from her restraints and call her mom, who then contacted Kesterson to come to the house. During the attack, her five children were all asleep. However, as for her husband, the father of three of those kids, Ernest Ernie Ibera Jr., he's nowhere in sight. He's saying that they hit her husband in the face about five times and drug him out. Police quickly arrive on the scene. So walk me through what happened. I don't honestly know what happened. Okay. I was in bed asleep. Okay. And we heard a noise, and the second I was able to open my eyes, somebody grabbed me and jerked me out of the bed and slammed me down on the ground and started tying me up. Didn't recognize anything about... They had black masks on, black shirts, black pants. Every inch of skin was covered. Home invasions are rare among average people because of the fact that there's so much risk involved, right? Because when you come into a home invasion, you're coming in with force, with weapons, you're holding people at gunpoint. The situation can easily spiral out of control. It was a very harrowing tale and very dramatic. Then when they dragged me downstairs, because they had him downstairs and they were separating us, I went downstairs and his face was covered in blood. Do you know what they were hitting him with? A gun. <laughs> At one point, Samantha says they bring her downstairs and have uh, her stand in front of him while they say, how can you not appreciate what you have here? You have this beautiful woman here. Why, how can you not appreciate this? How could he treat her so badly? Uh, that they exposed her and they used her to taunt him while they continued to beat him. Why would someone attack this couple? And where exactly is Ernie? Let's take a step back. After meeting in a tattoo shop in 2008, Samantha and Ernie began dating. Samantha, already a mother of two, ends up having three more children with Ernie, and the pair wed in 2014. Yet things between the two weren't picture perfect. I don't think that uh, they had a very uh, good relationship. Uh, it looked to me like he was doing um, everything he could to keep uh, the family financially afloat. He was working two jobs. She was not working. So what was she doing? I've always wanted to be an actress. I think it is so much fun. One of the most amazing forms of art ever to be able to express yourself that way. Wolford spent her days posting numerous videos on her own YouTube channel. When you first saw the YouTube videos, you know, it was more like, you know, personable and she was trying to do how-to types of videos. Hey guys, I'm doing a makeup tutorial today. Um, it's my first one, so don't be too harsh. But as time went on, you saw her videos become much more darker, much more complaining about her relationship, really putting her personal life on Front Street. Hey YouTubers, today a lot of shit pissed me off, so you guys get to listen to it. His dad's not having a whole lot to do with this pregnancy, and that sucks. I'm kind of screwed as far as dating goes because I date losers. 
I think that Samantha had this perception that other people really cared about her life and she fed into that perception. I think this was a source of excitement for her and she wanted attention. The problem is, is that this really developed into this kind of tunnel vision for her. It was her only focus and her family was really left to the wayside. What do you think of me making YouTube videos? Well, I guess I don't mind. It takes up a lot of time. This desire for Samantha to become a YouTube star or some kind of influencer really started to impact the relationship between her and Ernie. And Ernie felt a little bit forgotten. Not gonna light a cigarette? Oh yeah, I forgot about him. Cause you got that fucking iPad in your hands. Oh, where, 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 where? At least you're paying attention, but only because it's a fucking hilarious ass episode. Coming up, Samantha sits down with authorities and she realizes who may be behind this attack. I feel like there's something he hasn't been telling me, but I don't know what. What's your gut feeling to you? That I think it's something to do with his dad. They would have to either be familiar with the place to be able to do all that and know where they were asleep. In February 2015, authorities in Titus County, Texas are confronted with a strange situation. A woman named Samantha Wolford explains that unknown masked intruders broke into her home, attacked her and her husband, Ernie Ibera, and then kidnapped him while her kids were asleep upstairs. It's what Wolford remembers, though, about the comments from the assailants that provides a new clue. Did you hear him say anything else besides yeah, what you told us? They said that it was because of his dad. And that because of his dad? Yeah. Okay. And um, they said his dad knocked on someone and got their man thrown behind bars. And now they were taking revenge and taking someone from him. Could Ernie's father somehow be mixed up in all of this? As Wolford later tells detectives, she thinks he just might be. His dad has a problem with getting involved in things that he don't need to be getting involved with. Such as? Drugs. As law enforcement work to check out this lead, they notice that some things are off. I'm not really seeing a whole lot of blood though for somebody that was pistol whipped. Scene's not really making sense of what she's telling me. No, everybody's wearing all black black shoes, no identifying marks on them. There's also the matter of a bound Wolford calling her mom. My mother was the first number on my call list. I just used my face. And so instead of calling 911 for help, you called your mother? How do you press 911 with your face? Well, how did you dial your mother with your face? I didn't dial my mother. I just pushed the first thing that was on there. It had just happened to be my mom. I think you know exactly who did this. I think the story's made up about, about the, uh, well, your daddy, his daddy, and, and, and stuff like that. And I, I think you know, I think you know exactly really who did, did this, and I think you're scared. Samantha sees herself as an actress, but I think that she exaggerates her own abilities, and investigators really see right through her. The only other thing. Okay, see, I knew. You know, you know, Sam, you know I'm not here lying to you. You know I know. The only other thing I know, and I don't even know, I know, okay. but it's a suspicion. Okay. I've been up at the hospital with my friend Charlotte. Okay. And she's got a guy there, and I swear to God, I cannot go up there that I said any of this. Okay. Because they have a lot of friends around here, and my life will be in a lot of danger. Okay. I have a problem with talking to my friends about our problem. Mm -hmm. And he gets to talking about how a man should treat a woman that way and how you don't do those things to a person okay. and he's going to deal with the situation. Okay. I didn't take him seriously. Okay, you see, Sam, you know who did this. Okay, what, who is got, this guy? His name's John. John who? His Facebook is Rebel, John Rebel. As time went on, her story started to change because the reality is when you tell the truth, the truth doesn't change. And when the details start to switch up, that is definitely a cue for law enforcement that there's more happening here and that they need to dive deeper. What did you say when he said he's gonna take care of that problem? I just laughed at him. I thought he was joking. So now all of a sudden, why are you bringing him out? Because you know that it was him. 
Because Why do you know I, it's him? I just have this feeling like it was. Up next, we find out who this John Rebel is and also what happened to Ernie. They never told me why. They just told me that they are going to fuck this dude up. But the evidence we found on the scene, it's just not matching. I don't think you, I don't think you harmed this boy, but I think you know who did. It's February 2015, and young mother and YouTuber Samantha Wolford admits to Texas police she may know who's behind the abduction of her husband, Ernie Ibera. She explains that one day she had complained of her marital problems to her friend's boyfriend, who cryptically said he was going to deal with the situation, a statement that at the time, Wolford said she didn't take seriously. This man was identified as Jonathan Sanford. Now, Jonathan Sanford had recently been released from prison for molesting his cousin. Starting in junior high, he uh, enjoyed, you know, shaking kids down for lunch money. Uh, he's just that kind of guy. And he's really unapologetic about anything he did, um, illegal, wrong, immoral. Police quickly arrest Sanford as well as his brother-in-law, Jose Antonio Ponce. Jonathan Sanford and Jose Ponce were arrested the following morning and they were arrested because of information that Samantha finally disclosed to law enforcement. She had previously described that there were three of them, so I think law enforcement believed that there was at least one more person involved. Police also apprehend Octavius Lamar Rhymes, who Sanford enlisted for the attack on Ernie. Octavius Rhymes was from the nearby town of uh, Pittsburgh. He had been in the military. He was using drugs methamphetamine specifically, he wasn't doing anything uh, productive and that's kind of what put him in this situation. Pretty quickly after the Sheriff's Department detained and arrested uh, Jose Ponce and Jonathan Sanford, uh, those two individuals talked. Sanford decides to open up to police and explains how and why they attacked Ernie. Samantha talking about her relationship with me and Jay and my sister-in-law and all that and me trying to talk to her and help her out and all that because she seems like a good person to me and she was explaining to me how he treats the kids and all that if I ever see it or if I happen to be around or if I ever see her with bruises or the kids with bruises that so yeah I said I'd whoop his ass I did say I'd It's almost like his attitude was, well, you caught me, so I'm just going to lay it out there for you. Sanford recounts that after kidnapping Ibera, they took him to the woods and killed him. So Jonathan Sanford led the, the sheriff to where the body was. Sanford, Ponce, and Rhymes had taken Ernie to a remote location. They walked Ernie through the woods. He uh, was just in his boxers. He's been beaten to the point where he's, he's just moving. He, he's not really... I don't think coherent anymore. Jonathan Sanford had, had told us that his plan was initially to shoot Ernie, and then he decided not to, that he would slit his throat. And then before he had a chance to do that, Ponce shot him. Definitely did. Okay, what we need to do now. Oh yeah, he's dead, he's not gonna be alive. Jonathan Sanford said that uh, he, was, he wasn't expecting Ponce to do that. He uh, lifted up Ernie, saw that he was dead, and said something to the effect of game over, and then they left. Ernie Ibera is found dead, and the killers are apprehended. You might think the case is closed. Not quite. We're going to be, you know, checking your phone records for the last few months. Anybody that's involved in this and not connected to your phone? No. Okay. You're sure about that? Yeah. When we return. Look me in the face, sir. I need to know the truth. Did you have anything to do with Ernie's disappearance? No. And I Did you have anything to do with his death? No. In 2015, Texas investigators make a chilling discovery in the woods. The dead body of Ernie Ibera, a young man who was kidnapped after a reported home invasion. Police arrest three suspects, Jonathan Sanford, 
Octavius Rhymes, and Jose Ponce. Sanford would eventually confess and direct police to the corpse. Ibera's wife, Samantha Wolford, an aspiring YouTube star and mother of five, says despite her marital issues with Ibera, she was not involved. She does admit, though, that she had complained about Ibera to Sanford, who by all accounts got angry with how Ibera treated her and their kids. Yet, is that the whole story? Not even close. We had a pretty volatile past, and we've arrested him before. Yeah. Assaulting her and the infant. Make sure you know, she didn't do something to him and then stage the scene to make it look like something happened. Authorities note that the scene of the home invasion is suspicious, with no items taken, the kids being asleep the entire time, and the fact that immediately after undoing her binds, Samantha called her mom first, not 911. I think that Samantha wanted extra eyes. I think she wanted people to be able to corroborate her story. Up to that moment, it, it could have happened like she said. The officers arriving on the scene did not have any thorough understanding of how fragile the ribbons that she was tied up with were. And they didn't have the information regarding how she got her phone and how she was making phone calls. Where did he take that? Well, we've got a search warrant for your phone. That phone's gonna be ours for a while. Things are just not piecing together with your story. It's the phone data that would reveal so much. Let's go back to the body cam footage from the night of the home invasion. They took his phone to- So he's got his phone? No, they have his phone. Okay, that's what I'm talking about. Hey, all right, this is what we need to do. I need to do an emergency uh, phone ping, and I've got the cell phone number. Chris Durant calls uh, dispatch, and when he's doing that, she does ask if she can call or text her mother. Can I call my mom back? Yeah. Verizon gave us text messages from Octavius Rhymes' phone. That showed some back and forth between Samantha's phone and Octavius's phone. We had messages from her to the co-defendants to try to help them evade law enforcement. So the first one was at 2.30 a.m. Comparing uh, the time stamp on Durant's body-worn camera and her asking if she can call her mom or message her mom, at that moment, she sent Octavius Rhyme a text that said to the general effect, kill Day's phone, shut that down. Um, Day is a nickname that uh, Ernie Ibera went by. Are they getting anything off this phone? They're, they're trying to right now, so. But so far, nothing. Uh, they haven't heard back yet. Then there was a second message. She hears through the radio something about an address in Pittsburgh. There's someone seen 0.86 miles from a resident in Pittsburgh. You know anybody in Pittsburgh? Contact. Uh... As he turns around, she's picking up her phone. At that moment, she sent another text to Octavius Rhymes that said, ditch phone, move. And the phone records then showed a 30 second call between her and Octavius Rhymes just immediately after that. Text messages very clearly showed that she was the mastermind, that she was planning this, this wasn't an accident. She was an equal partner in all of this, not the innocent victim that she claimed to be. She may have been frustrated with her life. You know, obviously, 24-year-old mother, five children, money is a con was a constant struggle. You know, her husband was working several part-time jobs. I've had a lot of people stop me and ask about how I deal with things. Honestly, it's hard. Samantha had this warped way of thinking, this warped mental state that this was going to be the way that she got out of her relationship with Ernie. The thing is, if her plan was successful and she didn't get caught, then certainly she would be the YouTube star that she's always wanted to be. This would get her a lot of attention and she could play victim. And I think that's what she wanted. Sanford and Ponce pleaded guilty to abducting and murdering Ernie Ibera, and each were sentenced to 50 years in prison. Rhymes went to trial in two different counties, but was convicted in both cases, ultimately receiving a combined prison sentence of 98 years. As for Wolford, she also had two trials. We tried the kidnapping first. What she was trying to do is distance herself from the uh, text messages. 
The position she took, the testimony that she gave was that uh, she had been prescribed Ambien for sleep problems and that she had taken an Ambien and she really didn't remember anything that happened um, and didn't remember sending any text messages. The jury uh, just didn't believe it and uh, they convicted uh, her of the aggravated kidnapping and sentenced her to um, 50 years. A few months later, we tried her on the murder case in Camp County uh, and that jury uh, gave her 99 years. When the jury sees, uh, you know, the still shots from the body cam with, the same, with her on her phone at the very same time that the phone records show her sending text messages to the people who, you know, who killed her husband, that's some solid evidence that, that a jury uh, appreciates. While Wolford appealed her cases, her attempts were unsuccessful, and it seems she'll spend the rest of her life behind bars. I can shit somebody quick if they mess with me. Otherwise, I'm really nice. I love people. I like get along with people so well, and they love me, but don't cross me because then I can be really, really mean. It's bad. You know, sometimes you just can't make this stuff up even as much as you want to. For Samantha Wolford, she was looking for all the fame and attention in the world. And she definitely got her moment in the spotlight, just not how she imagined or wanted. That's all we have for you here on Prime Crime. Leave us your comments on Instagram and Twitter with the hashtag Prime Crime. As always, thank you for joining us. And until next time, be safe. On Prime Crime. She says she's having trouble breathing. She said she was stabbed multiple times. It's the attack on a young girl that left the nation stunned. As the details became more apparent in our investigation, it's, it's extremely disturbing. Is a supernatural force to blame? We think we fear sometimes. It didn't feel like anything. It was like air. And what can happen next may surprise you. She poses a significant risk of bodily harm to herself, others, or to property. Hey there, everybody. I'm Jesse Weber, and welcome to Prime Crime. This is where we do a deeper dive into the most high profile and memorable true crime cases. You know, there are a lot of motives to kill, but this one is unlike any other. What's the address of your emergency? Waukesha County Lynn, I'm transferring over a caller on Big Bend. May 31st, 2014, Waukesha, Wisconsin. A terrifying 911 phone call is about to start one of the strangest crime stories in modern American history. I came upon a 12 year old female. She appears to be stabbed. She appears to be what? Stabbed. A man named Greg Steinberg is out bicycle riding when he discovers a young girl bleeding on the side of the road. She says she's having trouble breathing. She said she was stabbed multiple times. You know, the nature of this crime scene was particularly horrific. You know, our victim was stabbed in the arms and the legs and many times in the abdomen. There were 19 stabbing motions. I mean, that the nature of this crime scene is just very, very violent. The victim is Peyton Leitner. She'd been attacked in the nearby woods, but was able to muster up enough strength to crawl out. She said she can take shallow breath. She's alert. And she didn't say who did this or how it happened? I don't know. I don't know if she wants to be talking. I started to ask okay. her and then... That's okay. Peyton is rushed to the hospital, where doctors frantically try to save her life. Miraculously, despite her extensive injuries, Peyton survives. She missed death by millimeters. I mean, one of the stab wounds just barely missed her heart. But largely, she lived because those wounds were just shallow enough that she did not have a heart attack and die right there on the scene. Hours later, police apprehend the assailants. The suspects were located near I-94, where they're both taken into custody without incident. The identity of the attackers turned out to be as shocking as the stabbing itself. Two 12-year-old girls, Morgan Geyser and Anissa Wire, classmates of Peyton. And it's, it's extremely disturbing uh, as a parent and as a chief of police. The will to carry out this attack means something is wildly amiss. That they would engage in that kind of activity and commit a really aggressive, heinous crime. That just doesn't happen without there being some A, red flag indicators, and B, an explanation for it of some type. Even more frightening is why the girls did it. Apparently, they were influenced by something they saw online. 
Keeping our children safe is more challenging now than in years past. The internet can also be full of dark and wicked things. You said like a character or something? A character that um, is on several different websites. Like a fictional character? Yes. Who was this fictional character? Anissa and Morgan decide to open up to detectives, and they say things that no one saw coming. Um, there's this website called um, the Creepy Pasta Wiki. Okay. It's full of like horror stories that are meant to purposely scare you. And there's one of them called Slenderman. Slenderman. The mysterious and unsettling horror character depicted as a faceless, elongated figure with multiple tendrils dressed in a dark suit. Although they're in separate interrogation rooms, both Morgan and Anissa provide the same motive for trying to kill Peyton, or whom they called Bella. She has these proxies or servants, as people call them, and um, Morgan and Anissa are like, Okay, how would you do that? She said, we have to kill Bella. Okay. Okay, and do you know why she said that? Like, why should she? Because we had to supposedly prove ourselves worthy to slander. How many times do you think you stabbed her? I don't know. It happened very quickly. All I heard was screaming. I said, I'm sorry. This had to happen, and she was like, why? And then I, just, I said that I was just, it was necessary. I can't, I can't explain why. According to the girls, during a slumber party, they lured Peyton out to the woods to play a game, but really intended to murder her. They claim that if they didn't do this for Slender Man, he would kill them and their families. We think we see him sometimes. Okay. Like when we were walking up to where to where we were going, I saw him out of the corner of my eye on this side. Okay. And then Morgan said she heard a twig crack when no one was moving. So I think there's no question that Slender Man and their belief in Slender Man played a role um, in their decision making on that day. Even the victim was able to say that during the time she was friends with Morgan, Morgan was quite obsessed with Slender Man. I believe at the time they did think it's either kill Peyton or our family is going to be killed by the Slender Man. In fact, after the stabbing, the girls walked about five hours before they were found. Where were they headed? Slender has this big mansion that all the creepy pastas supposedly live in. She wanted to walk to Morgan and Anissa aren't like other 12-year-olds. Morgan would be diagnosed with schizophrenia and Anissa with delusional disorder and depression. When you put two people together that have these you know, mental challenges, they can feed off each other. And I think the fact that you had two 12-year-olds who both had some mental disorders, they really connected. And when they're connected together like that, everything becomes more real. Is this a case of mentally ill, confused children who didn't know what they were doing? Or rather, an excuse for a meticulous, cold, premeditated act? After all, the girls discussed this attack on Peyton for months beforehand. The fact that this was so incredibly premeditated uh, over a six month period of time makes the whole thing even more shocking. One of the plans was to actually duct tape her mouth so she couldn't make any noise and then stab her out of sleepover. And the reason they didn't do that is they had skated and been out that evening and they were tired. A search of Geyser's home revealed more. There were internet searches for how to get away with murder and what kind of insane am I? And then there was the matter of what was found in Morgan's room. The Barbie dolls and the notebooks and the drawings, they're so dark and they're intense and they're disturbed. There were so many signs. It really looked like what she was reading about, drawing, just sort of a, a precursor to what was going to happen. There are parts of Morgan and Anissa's stories that appear to line up. The last thing she said to me, to, to me was, I trusted you. And then she said, I hate you. Saying stuff like, 
I hate you guys. I'll never forgive you. And I trusted you. Yet when it came to who's actually the mastermind and stabber, they pointed the finger at one another. Anisha told me we had to. Why? Because she said that he'd kill our families. So back in December or January, Morgan um, yeah. told you, like, hey, we, we should be proxies. Same thing. Yeah. Morgan and I were also debating um, who does the deed. At first it was me, but like I said, I was too squeamish and said, no, you do it. Morgan jumped on top of Bella and started stabbing her repeatedly, and that's when I turned around because I couldn't stand to see that. And then we said that we were going to play hide and seek, and then Anissa jumped her. Who stabbed her first? I think um, Anissa stabbed her first, and then I continued, and then like, she was like, Morgan, make sure she doesn't escape! And then it was like, uh... Anissa said that she'd go get help. I didn't have anything to do with the lying, well, that was all Anissa. They did blame each other in terms of their perception of what happened and how it happened. I think they both were just trying to be honest, but they were also both quick to say, it wasn't just my fault, I didn't do this part, she did that part. When we come back, we're going to take a further look into the minds of these girls. And then I didn't know what I did, it, was, it sort of just happened. It didn't feel like anything, it was like air. So, did you think that you actually had to kill somebody to do it? Yeah. Like, for real? Mm -hmm. Okay. Back in 2014, 12-year-olds Morgan Geyser and Anissa Wire admit to police that they stabbed their classmate Peyton Leitner to appease the fictitious online character known as Slenderman. But is one more responsible for this than the other? And how exactly should they be punished? Morgan and Anissa's interrogation videos provided the first glimpse into what they were thinking. While both accounts were chilling, there were startling differences. Morgan was cold. Morgan seemed completely unremorseful. Morgan seemed quite intelligent and quite manipulative. She seemed to really understand every single thing that was happening and had no guilt whatsoever for what she had done. We were careless. I knew this would happen. I knew we'd get in trouble. Why do you think it was your sleepover night that your Because sleepover? it was, we were all, we would all be together. It was a flawless plan, actually. So she put the knife in your hand, or what'd you do? I just continued to, you know what happened, didn't you? Anissa was a bit different. Anissa came off as a 12-year-old child. She did express some, just a tiny level of remorse for the decision she had made. The whole time, Peyton was screaming through agony. So we told her we were gonna get help, but we really weren't. We were gonna run and let her pass away. You definitely have this feeling, I think, listening to those interviews, that Morgan was more responsible, that she was the one that actually did the stabbing. But they both said things that made it clear that they were in this together. They shared mental disorder. They shared loneliness. They shared obsession with, you know, dark, scary things. And it's the combination of the two of them that created this event. Morgan and Anissa are charged with attempted first-degree intentional homicide. In 2016, after a lengthy legal battle making it all the way to the Court of Appeals, it's determined both defendants, who are then 14 years old, are to be tried as adults. In this case, these two girls committed such a horrible crime that the view was they need to be punished. They tried to kill another 12-year-old. The problem with civil court um, or juvenile court is that once a child turns 18, the courts don't have control over that child anymore. And the concern is, is that a 12 year old um, at 18 may not be ready to be out on their own considering such a violent crime. 
The prosecution of these two girls for attempted murder became a national story, with many appalled and in disbelief over the motive. Yet there were others who felt sympathy. The interrogations themselves ignited a ton of discussion. They don't understand what it means to be interrogated necessarily. They don't understand how they say things, their body language, what they say can be used against them. And so I think there's an inherent unfairness do I believe, regardless of my belief that a parent should have been there, that both of them understood their rights? I think there's no question that Morgan did. Morgan is, I assume, of incredibly high intellect. She understood every single thing that was going down that day. Anissa, it's a bit less clear. Um, again, a child can understand um, those rights, but I think it's, it's not quite as clear with Anissa as it is with Morgan. In 2017, Anissa changes the game. She agrees to plead guilty to attempted second-degree murder, but she wants a trial to determine if her mental illness excuses her from being criminally responsible and ultimately from winding up behind bars. The case against Anissa and Morgan was overwhelming. Um, but one thing that was also, as far as they were concerned, overwhelming was the evidence of her mental disease or defect. The prosecution thought that they had evidence to establish that the mental disease or defect did not have a huge impact on the decision making of Anissa and Morgan. Their position was that Anissa didn't believe some of the issues regarding Slenderman until after the child had been stabbed. A majority of the jury would end up agreeing with the defense and decided that even though this was a violent planned out crime, Anissa shouldn't go to prison. Instead, they say she needs treatment. So what they did find is by virtue of a mental illness or mental defect, she did not have the ability to know right from wrong. You have to realize it wasn't just one doctor or two doctors that found that Anissa had a mental health issue during the time that this crime happened. There was a third doctor. That third doctor was actually a doctor that was assigned by the court. That very same month, Morgan follows suit. She pleads guilty to attempted first-degree intentional homicide. In this agreement, prosecutors don't fight the mental illness question. Instead, they resolve that she should remain at a psychiatric health facility. Legally, she was not held responsible, and that's a good outcome for somebody who has committed this crime. How long would Morgan and Anissa be committed to an institution? Anissa was up first, and at her sentencing, we learned new and eerie details about her from her family. There were times during our conversations where she would look almost blank. She's talked about going to school and becoming an advocate for children in her situation. There have been times when she said, I don't know why. I would have done this. Of course, a judge wants as much information that's admissible or allowed to be shown before making a decision of this gravity. Now, having said that, there's a distinction in my mind between this is how she's acting, this is how she's helpful, versus the reality of mental health needs and treatment. Before the judge rendered his sentence, we heard from Anissa herself. I do hold myself accountable for this and that I will do whatever I have to do to make sure that I don't get any sort of delusion or whatever again. I want everybody involved to know that I deeply regret everything that happened that day. I'll do whatever I have to do to make sure that this doesn't happen. And I know you've heard that before and you're probably going to hear it again, but it's the truth and I'm sorry. I think those are great words, but when you have any type of mental health issues, there's a difference between thinking that, believing that, and saying that, and being willing and able to actually follow through with mental health treatment. Swire continues to believe that Slenderman is real. She also stated that as recently as July 2017, she believed that an evil spirit was pushing down her, on her bed after the spirit had been let out of a homemade Ouija board. She has continued to be easily influenced by peers. She has been convinced by another inmate who is a devil worshiper that her co-actor, meaning uh, Miss Geyser, is possessed. What's best for the community 
may not be what's best for Anissa Wire. As much as we can sit back and say, I will never do that again, and I think it's sincere, I'm not criticizing her for saying it, we don't know. Anissa was ordered to spend the next 25 years in a mental hospital. You know, this judge recognized the seriousness of this crime. He also made it very clear that but for the grace of God, this child would have been dead. Two months later, Morgan had her sentencing. To let Ella and her family know, I'm sorry. I've never been this to happen. I hope that she's doing well. It was so interesting to see Morgan um, at her sentencing and how different she appeared than she had when she was first interrogated after the stabbing incident. She was more emotional, remorseful. Now, could that have been manipulation? Absolutely. But I, I took it to be real sincere uh, emotion for what she had done. She sounded so childlike. I just feel like her maturity to accept and handle the consequences was different than presented by Anissa. The circumstances of the wire case are different than they were in this case. The biggest underlying difference is the uh, long history of delusions. When she saw the Slender Man uh, silhouette, she said she recognized that as the, a man who had visited her throughout the years when she was three or four. She poses a significant risk of bodily harm to herself, others, or to property. The judge sentenced Morgan to 40 years of institutional care. Morgan seemed to take a stronger role in regards to what went down that day. Um, and the judge may have just recognized that delineation along with the lack of remorse that she had shown all along. At the time of this taping, Morgan's lawyers are appealing the case, arguing that she should never have been tried as an adult. Peyton Leitner has moved on with her life with plans to enter into the medical field, but that doesn't mean she's forgotten what happened, nor won't pay attention to what happens next. Legally, both Morgan and Anissa can now petition every six months for conditional release from the hospital, with Anissa's case scheduled to be heard March 2021. Here's the reason why I might consider early release. Number one, their behaviors while they're in the facility. Number two, their diagnosis and treatment plan. Are they able, capable of maintaining a treatment plan so that if they are released early, they can be expected not to commit another crime? Both Morgan and Anissa could eventually get out. Keep in mind that the judge has to make a determination as to how dangerous each of those individuals are in the community. One only needs to look back at the interview, particularly the interview of Morgan. Anyone who watches that video will never think it's safe to have this girl out of a mental health facility. Three lives changed forever by one moment. It's a haunting story for many reasons, and it's one that could have resulted in something far worse. And with legal developments still up in the air, it's a story that's still being written. That's all we have for you on Prime Crime. Leave us your comments on the Slender Man stabbing on Facebook and Twitter with the hashtag Prime Crime. As always, thank you for joining us, and until next time, be safe.